everybody. Welcome to another episode of Two Strike Noise, your weekly baseball history podcast. I'm half the show. My name is Jeff. The other half, isn't it Mark A. Johnston? Yes, that's the actual me, yes. You know, I I am rereading uh, Keith Hernandez's first book called uh, If at First. It's, from, it's, a, it's a recap of the 1985 Mets season, and this is one of the first baseball books. I've referenced it many times on this show, but this is one of the, I think, might have been the first baseball kind of biography I ever read. You know, I was pretty young when I checked this out of the library, just getting into baseball. Rereading this beyond the names... Uh, that I hear like Rusty Staub is uh, one of Keith's good friends on the 1985 team. You and I have talked about him quite a bit, but I've also noticed that I now know where a lot of my baseball thoughts are formed from. This book had a very, it resonated with me. Apparently there's a lot of things I'm rereading in here. And I'm like, I th- this must be where I got that idea from. <laughs> it's very interesting. Um <laughs> Not a great book, clearly not written by Keith, uh, as I've uh, inadvertently told him to his back. Yeah, it's, I'm still enjoying it nonetheless. A lot of good names. Remembering and using an immaculate grid from it. So, very oh, helpful. Oh, yeah, see, you're beefing up on it. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, we've already, we've already started the BP process here, Mark. Let's continue with it here before we get into the main segment today. I, I did want to, uh, I did want to mention this. If you cannot get enough of me... As in Jeff, not Mark. No, you know, you can never get enough Mark, uh, is what I've been told. Uh, it's n- certainly not the case with me. Oh, it's true. But <laughs> if you can't get enough of me, but you're like, Jeff, I'm tired of hearing you talk about baseball. I'd rather you talk about a, a musical from the, uh, from the 1960s or 70s. I don't remember when it came out. Uh, specifically, The Music Man. Guess what? If I got a podcast for you. Look in the show notes. There's a link. I was a guest on the Next Scene podcast where all we talked about was the Music Man. That was it. They want they wanted somebody to talk Music Man. I said I'm your guy. Did your booking agent get that for you? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Nice. They still they'll call you. Don't worry. Uh, don't call them. They'll oh, call sure. you. Mark. Don't. <laughs> yeah, so my uh, deep knowledge of of, of movie musicals. Well, uh, hey, I like most of them, but uh, I don't think I could do a show on it. Well, I mean, check out the podcast because uh, they do it. Then other episodes on Seinfeld, on uh, a bunch of things that are right up our alley. A lot of oh, like eighties and nineties uh, movies and TV shows that is really kind of right up our alley. So uh, make sure to check that out. Uh, links will be in the show note as well. But Mark, I mentioned Immaculate Grit. Uh, I, I'm still pretty obsessed with this every day. I don't know about you. I play it every single day without fail. Is, yeah. is that obsessed? Yeah. It, like, yeah. Okay. When I played Wordle, it was sometimes a chore to play every day. But right. I, work, I, I wake up each day and I'm like, no, I'm not going to open the grid yet. I need, to, I need to do X, Y, and Z first and kind of make it a reward. <laughs> but this is, I've got some improvements that I'd like to suggest for this. Okay. I mean, first of all, I mean, they've branched into men's and women's basketball, hockey, football, uh, soccer. I, I mean, they're pretty soon it's going to be underwater basket weaving. And then, you know, who knows that what after that. But my suggestions here. One, if you miss an answer, let the user choose to keep going and finish the grid. Yeah. Maybe give them a penalty for missing. But I, I want to be able to finish it even if I miss one or two. So that's one thing I would like. So, like, I could have sworn Tony Eusebio played for the Astros and the Reds, but he didn't. I think literally the only person on this planet who could name every team Tony Eusebio played for during his career is Tony Eusebio. But and that he might even struggle. Yeah, he might, but that ruined my grid for the whole day, right? Uh, I got, yeah, exactly. I can't fill that in and take another guess. Give me a hundred point penalty. I don't care. I just like to be able to do it over or not do it over, but you know, finish it. Yeah. Mark, do you do two grids a day? Like maybe one on your phone and then one on the computer. I don't, I just do my phone. Uh, I usually do one just to get nine out of nine and you know, whatever my score is, you know, most of the time, Get a lot of very popular answers, but then I do another one where I'm just focused on getting a low score and I can't use anything that I've used in the other grid. So you should be able to do this as many times as you like, I think, but you can't repeat answers. 
So if I fill a nine out of nine, do you want to play again? Yes. And then I get to do it again, but I can't use any of the, the guys that I filled in the previous game. Oh, that's interesting. Then I, you could retain people. They would be playing longer, right? Right. Uh, I, I sometimes will play a game where I try to only fill in the squares with guys that have black and white pictures. Ooh. Because those are generally low scores anyway. People are generally not not doing that. Like, there was a square that was Oakland in Hall of Fame, and I know you think I automatically go with Ricky, which... Right. Uh, I did not because I put him in the Red Sox Hall of Fame square and got 2%. Well, in the A's square, he was the most popular answer and would have, you know, really jacked my score up. Right. I went with Chief Bender in the A's Hall of Fame for a 0.3. Very nice. So, Chief see? Bender. Yeah, Chief Bender. Great you can learn all about him on uh, some of these uh, history shows. Yeah, we've talked about him here before and as an A's fan – you know, throughout their history until now. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mark, let's talk about Jose Kendo for a minute. Sure. Uh, Jose Kendo, nicknamed the secret weapon. Uh, look at the positions he played in baseball reference. It looks like a phone number. <laughs> uh, he played everywhere. Uh, some important things that jump out here, though. Jose Kendo has one more postseason home run than Ted Williams does. Wow. And by that, I mean Jose Kendo has one postseason home run. Oh, yes, I got you. But he's also struck out uh, Deion Sanders. Can Ted Williams say that? I doubt it. I doubt it either. (laughs) But so Kendo played for 12 years in the big leagues. Three different times he pitched. One of those games, though, he pitched four innings. Wow. Yeah, he struck out, uh, let's see, he struck out one batter there, walked six, two of which were intentional, uh, four hits, two runs. He did take the loss. That was uh, like a 16-inning game. I, in fact, I think we've talked about this game before because in this game, Jose de Leon and uh, Tom Brunanski were going back and forth in the outfield because they had run out of players. So depending on the handedness of the batter, they would shift uh, between uh, left and right. But (laughs) it was, yeah, we have discussed that. Yeah. It was a 19 inning game. The uh, Atlanta won seven to five. And like I said, a Kendo got the loss. The box score is interesting because Atlanta, the only places they had pinch hitter was in that number nine spot. Like it, Everybody else that started on defense, except for the pitcher, played all 19 innings. For the Cardinals, it is just a mess. <laughs> uh, Vince Coleman got pinch hit four after eight at-bats. Uh, Terry <laughs> Pendleton only had five at-bats. Bob Horner, three. I mean, so, you know, some of these guys that are valuable didn't play a whole lot. So it's a really interesting box score. I think we've talked about it before, but... I saw that, that Jose Kendo, more home runs in the postseason than Ted Williams and has struck out Deion Sanders. Well, you kiss my grits. I don't believe it. I wonder, I maybe we'll need to look and see how many other guys Jose <laughs> Kendo has more postseason home runs and has struck out uh, Deion Sanders then. Everybody but you and I, I think. I did notice something about a Kendo interesting in 88. He did play every position, yep. including pitcher. And uh, in 89, he, had, he played in 163 games. Oh, he just he didn't want to stop. He just kept going. It's 80, so I'm assuming they had a playoff game that year. No, 1989. 89 is when there's 163 games, yeah. yeah. Did the, did, I'm assuming it was a one-game playoff. Yeah, I don't remember that. The Cardinals and 89 would have been, I mean, the Giants were in the West, and the Cardinals mm-hmm. were in the West. Yeah. I really don't remember that. <laughs> I don't either. 163 games, though. That's a lot of games. There's no playoffs. Well, you didn't get traded or anything. That's weird. Yeah. So what what is up with that? Where what are we missing? 1989. There's 163 games for the Cardinals. And yeah, they, they didn't fin- have a one game play. I mean, they finished third with an 86. Oh, they finished 86, 76, and two according to Baseball Reference. What? What? <laughs> well. That's- Totally bizarre. We're going to have to dig into that and just see what, why they played. I mean, because their record is technically 162. So how did he play in a hundred? Oh, I wonder if they, they must have had a game that 
uh, went the it was tied and it went five innings and then it got postponed, not postponed, but canceled or or something. And so they play. They just started over. But those stats counted. I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, we'll have to check that. We'll we'll get we'll circle back on that next week because I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, speaking of Ricky Hill, uh, one of our guests last week. I hope uh, everybody went out and, and saw the movie. Good movie. Uh, he mentioned a skit on Saturday Night Live with Bill Murray. Yes. Uh, first of all, I mean the dude's got Bill Murray, Andre Dawson. Uh, who else did he have in his that he had just talked to? <laughs> he is a mover and a shaker, but uh, I'll put the link in the show notes uh, to this skit. I have seen this before. It's not really a skit either. It's like a, a 10 minute like uh, movie. It is very much in the ilk of Lost in translation where, you know, it, there's there's jokes and it's funny, but there's also kind of an overwhelming arch uh, here. He's just trying to follow his lifelong dream of being a baseball player. He gives up comedy, goes out to the Pacific Northwest and uh, hooks up with this uh, this team of which Ricky Hill is on. Ricky Hill has lines in this and Bill's like, hey, Rick, what's up? I mean, it's it's not just him in the background being a player kind of doing his own thing while the camera's out. He had bill actually involves him in the, in the thing. So pretty cool. I'll put that in the show notes, check out the show notes. They are going to be rich this week, full of goodies. So most people don't read the show notes and I actually have to write those every week. <laughs> yeah, so Jeff takes those show notes very seriously, folks. You should check them out. I do. I run them through AI. I have a couple of people proofread yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. So uh, Jordan Lyles, current player today, he is a uh, pitch for the Kansas City Royals. And uh, did you know this, Mark, that currently he is uh, tied for the lead league in complete games with three? He has lost no. all three of them. Oh, that's rough. Well, I mean, when you're on the worst team in baseball, which I can say that at the time of this recording. Right. Uh, yeah, he is uh, four and fifteen is his record this year with a six point two nine ERA. Yeah, that's rough. Yeah, he leads the league in earned runs given up as well as walks. So he's having a rough time, but you know he's gone three complete games. So hey, uh, you know what he he held up his end of the bargain. I don't know what the scores were. I, I, they couldn't have been blowouts. He wouldn't be in there for nine right. innings. So yeah, he did a good yeah, job. So there's something to look at. Something positive. All right. Uh, let's see. We haven't mentioned one of the Gabbies for quite a while here on this podcast. And I am going to go ahead and just we need to bring back a Gabby. Uh, let's do Gabby Hartnett today. How about that? Sounds like a good one. Yeah. So uh, Gabby, member of Chicago Cubs, he won three pennants with the Cubs. Cubs are obviously in Chicago. All right. So in the uh, in the mid 30s, Al Capone is in the front row of the Cubs game with his nephew. And uh, during uh, during batting practice, warm up, he yells to Gabby to come over, waves him over. So Gabby comes over. Al Capone, Scarface, he introduces his uh, nephew to uh, Gabby Hartnett. A photographer happened to be there right there. He caught the picture, made the paper the next day. Kennesaw Mountain Landis, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, the uh, commissioner. Uh, at that point, who was stationed in Chicago, saw it and uh, he said, that's not a good look for baseball. So he calls Hartnett in and he tells him, uh, I don't want you to talk to Al Capone anymore. It's a bad image for the game. If you, if you see him at the ballpark, just ignore him. And uh, Gabby says, hey, you bet, Judge. Uh, your rule, it's fine with me. And as he turns to leave, he turns back and says, but uh, you tell Al Capone that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good story. <laughs> yes. How do you think Al got hooked up with front row tickets? That's amazing. Yeah, I wonder. Does he know anybody or? <laughs> I don't know. Weird. Uh, let's see, Mark. This show is debuting on September 6th. Now, we are in the old September call-up range here. Where yes. rosters used to expand from 25, 26 to 40 and it was ridiculous and there were a ton of players and you're playing the most important month of the season with uh, guys that you didn't play the rest of the season with. They have changed that. I applaud it. Uh, I hate Rob Manfred, but I I'm okay with this one. 
but there are so many names here. I couldn't really go through and pick out just a couple. There's a lot of great 70s through 90s players, which I'm assuming the 70s probably when this uh, window opened, who made their debuts today. That it's impossible to narrow them down. So I just grabbed a couple of quick ones. Not going to go super in depth on them. 1972 making his debut today, Pete Lecoq. We've talked about him many times besides just having an awesome name. Uh, he was Bob Gibson's final foil. Uh, yes. Drove Bob Gibson to retirement, but got his revenge in Old Timers Day down the line. Also, uh, big fan of uh, Hollywood Squares, Pete Lecoq. So uh, congratulations on making his debut. Making his debut the same day is Gary Matthews. He came up with San Francisco. I think, you know, everybody thinks, I, at least I think of Sarge as being a Philly, but he came up with San Francisco and was the rookie of the year in 1973. So, but he made his debut today. And another name that we talked about last week, 1974, Warren Cromarty, Ricky oh, Hill's yeah. old teammate, was uh, made his debut in the majors today. He also went on to play in Japan for the Yamiuri Giants. He was a batting champ there and an MVP and uh, won the, the Climax Series with the Giants there. So he had a great career in uh, in Japan as well as being one of those young Expos outfielders with Tim Raines and Andre Dawson and just uh, that that team that never never quite lived up to their... Their, their expos expectations, I'll say they right. went on to be great players, but elsewhere. Uh, also today, Mark, in 1995, I think everybody here that's a baseball fan will remember watching a game in 1995 today, September 6th, because Cal Ripken Jr. played in his 2131st consecutive game, surpassing Lou Gehrig's 56-year record. Yes. I remember specifically uh i was what uh, i was uh yeah i was it was like the last week i was home before i had to head back to washington state finish my senior year and i remember why i remember right where i was watching that game too ripkin received a 22 minute standing ovation went two for four including a home run as they beat the california angels and fortunately nobody made him change positions uh on short notice like a rod right did. You know, and another thing, uh, he played 162 games as he always did, but uh, was one short of Jose Akendo. Yeah, Jose Akendo <laughs> was like, bro, that's that's cute. But, you know, back in 89. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, speaking of things from last week, Mark, we've got uh, something we got to go to court for here really quick. Uh, as usual, uh, longtime listener Marshall is putting the screws to us. I was talking last week about Little League uh, World Series and listing off some of the favorite players that uh, the kids uh, the kids mentioned. And apparently uh, I said Mike Trout and Mike Judge. So oh, I love Mike Judge. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember Mike Trout. When I was editing, I heard Mike Judge and I'm like, let's just see if anybody picks it up. And there it is. Um, I'm going to pass my fine over to you. He fined both of us, but I'm going to send mine to you because, again, you didn't catch it. And that is your job. So, right. Yeah, my mistake. Yeah, don't let that happen again. But uh, all right. So those are our debuts and one event that happened today on September 6th. And with that, Mark, that's going to wrap up our uh, BP segment. Let's head into the main bulk of the show here, which this week I'm going to talk about something. Originally, Mark, I was going to do a story about some of the great drinking stories from baseball. Not shockingly, there were a lot of Mickey Mail stories as I was sifting through them. But I came across a name that I had heard before, but I didn't know anything about. And that name was Steve Bilko. Okay. Do you know Steve Bilko? You know, the name sounds familiar, but I'm not sure why. I'll pro- yeah, I'll, I'll probably tell you. You'll probably figure it out here as we go through this. So first thing I thought of was... Hey, isn't that Jerry Springer's like bald security guy <laughs> who would half heartedly try to break up the chair throwing and cat fights on the Jerry Springer show? But that is, in fact, Steve Wilco. So, no, not him. Uh, Steve Wilco, though, wishes he was uh, Steve Bilko because his entire life, Bilko was always the biggest guy in any room he went into unless his father was there. Just a hulking individual. 
But his father was unbelievably even bigger. Bilko was an all-state guard in football before he was scouted in high school playing his favorite sport of baseball. He was consequently signed by the Cardinals as a junior in 1945. That's a junior in high school he was signed by the Cardinals. So it tells you how good of a ball player this guy was. Steve's minor league career consisted of hitting bombs, bombs, and more bombs. Bombs, though, that were often followed by the phrase, quote, the longest home run ever hit in the history of this ballpark, end quote. Uh, But bombs were not the only thing he hit. He also hit triples, doubles, and a lot of singles. His power was prestigious, but he also hit for average. He hit 311 in over 1,500 games uh, throughout his career in different leagues and had several seasons where he knocked in more than 100 RBI. 1949, Bilko had a cup of coffee, but the next spring he got his shot. He was already a big guy, but something happened over the winter. He'd gotten married to his childhood sweetheart, so they moved in together, and so did her mother. So it's a good news, bad news situation here. Mother-in-law living with you. For most people, that's not great news. Mother-in-law living with you who knows how to cook, though. That's generally good news. Maybe maybe too much good news, in fact, though. Bilko claimed he didn't want to leave any food on his plate so as not to hurt his mother-in-law's feelings. So coming into spring training, he tipped the scales at 260 pounds. (laughs) Wow. Which... Back in those days, he might have been might as well have been Andre the Giant because Mm -hmm. athletes and baseball players just weren't that big back in that day. Thus started a cycle of baseball know-it-alls saying you can't have a body shape like Bilko and play baseball. I mean, look at what it did to Babe Ruth's game, eh? (laughs) Just (laughs) I turned Canadian there for a minute, too. Uh, So just like wrestlers trying to make weight, Steve had to sweat off weight almost every day before games, even, Uh, you know, running in rubber suits and then being expected to go out there and play a game of baseball. Uh, Who knows what kind of machines they probably hooked him to to exercise back then as well. I'm always fond of that machine with the big belt attached to it. So all it does is shake you. Yes, those work, don't they? (laughs) Well, that's why they're clearly still around today. Uh, I guess today we have those wraps, though, that actually give you little shocks so it makes your muscles work. You know, yeah, I've seen those. Yeah, I don't think they work that good because I don't see a lot of people walking around with rock abs. (laughs) Well, I mean, they could be just under a shirt they don't like a lazy guy you know if i if i had rock abs and i was still a, a, a heavy guy i would walk around with my shirt off just to show, show the abs yeah well not all of us like to some of us are just quietly confident at the mall and stuff like that <laughs> well just listen <laughs> when i'm sitting around on the sofa monitoring ebay bids on that satin jacket with a thousand joy Votto heads on it I don't want to exercise. Strap one of those bad boys on, and I feel like I've done my my workout for the day. So <laughs> okay, okay. Well, you know, we'll just have to agree to disagree on this one. <laughs> All right, but I'm right. Uh, so just imagine if like Dave Parker or Cecil Fielder would have played then. Uh, oh god, Jesus! They would they would have lost their everybody. mind. Yeah, or, or if uh, one of those baseball know it alls watched a game today, they wouldn't have any idea. They would think like aliens landed and. <laughs> Uh, Let's see. Bilko bounced up and down between the big, struggling to get consistent playing time as well as being hampered by injuries. 1953, things lined up again, though, and Bilko was in the starting lineup on opening day, batting fourth between Stan Musial and Enos Slaughter. So, you know, no pressure at all for the big guy. That's that's protection before and after. I mean, that's that's got to be a great place to bat, assuming you can hit. No question. So Steve hit okay. He ended the season with the slash line of 251, 334, 412. He had 21 home runs, 84 RBI, 70 walks, and 125 strikeouts. That led the league in strikeouts. Today, 125 Ks is like, I mean, it's almost league average, I say with a, a big grain of salt. But back then, it was a problem and even considered embarrassing. The next season, he split time at first with Tom Alston, the Cardinals' first African-American player. Team owner Augie Bush made it clear that he was not bringing black players aboard because he thought they should have equal rights, but he figured that black people drink beer too, so he told scouts to sign them. Okay, well, marketing. Yeah, he's a great human being, that. Oh, yeah. Augie Bush. (laughs) 
<laughs> Way to go. Uh, the inconsistent playing time again hurt Bilko with his average hovering around about half his weight. That's 150 for those of you out there that did not expect there to be math on this week's show. Nice. He was ultimately sold to the Cubs, so you know that they wanted to get rid of him uh, because the Cardinals just selling a player to the Cubs doesn't really happen. <laughs> you know, unless they're like, yeah. We, no, yeah. Yeah, sure, take him. Uh, but the Cubs had no real ABs for Bilko either, and after appearing in only 47 games for the Cubs, he was sent to the PCL and the Los Angeles Angels. Now, you know what Los Angeles baseball in the 50s means if you've listened to this podcast before. That meant that Steve was playing his home games at none other than the other friendly confines of Wrigley Field. Yes. In between episodes of the Home Run Derby and the occasional Mr. Ed episode, Bilko was staring down a short fence that could it didn't even have a chance to hold his prestigious dad strength blasts. In three seasons with L.A., Bilko won the MVP award three times. He hit 37, 55, and 56 home runs while boasting a 328, 360, and 300 average in each season respectively. He still struck out a lot, though, which was a show unto itself for fans to see. I mean, you know, you love to see, like, Reggie Jackson swing, whether he hits it or not, because it's just this all-out effort. So it's a it's a show to see whether he makes contact or not. But he also walked a lot more, and his on-base average was actually 421 not for bad. those three seasons. That's, that's outstanding. So, the 1956 season was exciting for fans as Bill Cole came close to eclipsing the league mark for home runs in a season in the PCL set by Tony Lazari in 1925 with 60. Wow. Lazari hit those 60 home runs during a 200-game schedule. Oh, my God. That's more than half a year's worth of scheduled games. I mean, can you imagine if you worked... For a team that had 200 games on their schedule, that's 100 home games you're just locked into. It's a lot. I like yes, baseball. That's, that's a lot of baseball. Uh, Bilko Mania took over Tinseltown. In a precursor to the Schwanometer, the local paper printed a Bilko Homerometer each day. That's awful. A Homerometer. Homero? A Homero. Okay, okay that's, yeah, that's lame. Yeah, that's not good. Glad that there was time for somebody to do some workshopping, though, between the Bilko Homerometer and the Schwanometer, because the Homerometer, not great. Schwanometer, awesome. So, yes. Beyond being MVP that season, he also won the league's triple crown with a 360 batting average, 164 ribs, and also led the league with 215 hits, 163 runs scored, 104 walks, 410 total bases, and a 687 slugging percentage. Phew. Wow. Yeah. I mean, those are those are arcade like numbers. That's uh, those yes. are crazy. Uh, I told you that I was looking into drinking stories when I came across Bilko's name. Uh, here is one that uh, fits in well here because he was a big, big dude, big drinker. Uh, he would take a case of beer into the bathroom, whether it be at home or on the road in a hotel. He would stuff towels in the crack around the door, turn on the hot shower to steam the alcohol out of his body while he drank it. <laughs> I don't know if this works or not, but uh, a, shot. a teammate of Vilko's who knew that he did this said, quote, he could put away a case of beer after a game and you wouldn't know he'd had a single drink, end quote. Wow. Now that's a beer lover. Yeah. I mean, so we need to determine, was he the precursor to the Shano meter or to Wade Boggs? <laughs> Especially in those cross country flights. Yeah. <laughs> well, the PCL is <laughs> just up and down the coast, so he didn't have all that time, or you know, he had to drink it faster. Yeah, You're didn't right. need to refuel in North Dakota or wherever they stopped. But uh, I mean, remember Andre the Giant, who I already mentioned in this story. <laughs> he, Oddly enough, yeah. I mean, he couldn't drink. I mean, first of all, the cans looked like thumbtacks in his hand, but I mean. He would have to drink for days to get drunk. Oh, yeah. So getting back to Steve here, 1957, the Cubs sold the Angels to the Dodgers, who were preparing to move the team west to Brooklyn. 
Bilko threatened the single season home run record again, finishing with 156 homers while also leading the league with 140 RBIs, 111 runs scored, 353 total bases, 108 walks, and 150 strikeouts. I mean, those are close to the numbers he had the year before, which we just said were crazy. But right. Bilko enjoyed his time as a big fish, literally, in a medium-sized pond. We've discussed what a great league the PCL was, but it wasn't the major leagues. In 1958, he spent 31 inconsistent games up with the Reds, where he platooned with fellow very large man Ted Kluzinski. Can you imagine being a little second baseman at this time and a brawl breaks out and Steve Bilko and Big Clue come running at you? Oh, man. Can you imagine the bills for the, the clubhouse spread? <laughs> I'm just thinking if this happened, yeah, I'd be like that Japanese pitcher when Rod Allen tried to chase <laughs> yes, him down in the MPB. <laughs> Steve was sent packing to L.A., this time for the Dodgers. It was a homecoming with the city of Los Angeles, but no Wrigley Field for the Dodgers. They had temporarily moved to the L.A. Coliseum while Dodger Stadium was being built. And if you think the polo grounds had some odd dimensions, the baseball configuration for the Coliseum would make you blush. With the power alleys in Wrigley were 345. At the Coliseum, they were 425. Ooh. It's an 80 foot difference. Bilko sat for almost the first month before he got his first start. The fans went crazy to see their guy come to the plate, where, of course, on his first day B, he crushed a three run homer. Of course. Same story, different day. But it was more of the same. Little consistent playing time, and he bounced between AAA and the big leagues before ending up on the expansion Los Angeles Angels initial roster. I think he holds the record for most Los Angeles teams played for. He has to. <laughs> yeah. uh, it just so happened that the Angels were playing their first season at Wrigley Field. So, as he had done many times before, Bilko, to put a cherry on the top of the season, launched a walk-off two-run home run in the final game ever played at the venue in the big leagues. That's beautiful. Yeah. 1963, the 34-year-old was signed by the Orioles and sent to AAA Rochester. Here he was teammates to none other than Lucius Luke Easter. So, if you don't know who Luke Easter is... <laughs> yeah. You just got to go back a couple of weeks, or if you've forgotten most of what I talked about, like I have, go back and re-listen to it. <laughs> uh, Steve retired the next year and became, as many professional ball players do after retiring, a perfume salesman. Of course. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, though, Luke died at the young age of 49. Because he never really got a fair shake in the big leagues, it's best to kind of look at his PCL numbers, uh, as those are pretty close to MLB numbers, and uh, he was playing consistently there, where in three seasons he played 488 games, knocked 148 home runs, drove in 428, and slashed 331, 421, 638. Now, I hinted at Steve's popularity in Los Angeles with fans, but those fans were not just the hard hat and lunch pail crowd. Steve had actors, writers, and other Hollywood elite amongst his biggest fans. This guy named Nate Hicken, H-I-K-E-N, I I don't know if I'm saying that right, but he was a writer, and he was working on a show called The Phil Silvers Show, which was an army situation comedy starring none other than Phil Silvers. Hicken was such a big fan of Steve's that he decided to name his main character after him. So... Phil Silver's character became Sergeant Ernie Bilko. Oh, my gosh. Now, I've never seen this show. I think I've heard of it. I guess, well, I I don't guess. They did make a movie based on the show with Steve Martin as the lead in the 90s, but I have not seen that either. But pretty cool that this main sitcom character is named after a baseball player. Yeah. How popular was Bilko at the height of his Angels fame, you might ask? How popular was Bilko at the there height of the Angels fan? Uh, I found this great story that involved another Los Angeles legend, Tommy Lasorda. I don't know if you've heard of him or not, Mark. We, I'm not sure if we've touched on that. But uh, he was a teammate of Steve in Los Angeles, and he told a story about a game where Lasorda went out and shut out the crosstown rival, the Hollywood Stars. Bilko actually took the collar in the game, took the offer, but the next day's headlines 
Didn't even mention Lasorda or his shutout. Instead, the next day's headlines in the local paper read, Bilko fails to get a hit. <laughs> yes, that's what's important at that yep. point. There are some pictures that I've seen on social media of Steve when he was with the Angels. I've talked about how he was a big name in a town of really big names. He was just as famous at his height as the big name actors and actresses of the time. But the photo that I, I see most and, and intrigues me the most uh, is him and Betty White on the field pregame smiling for the cameras. That's so cool. It looks like Betty White is standing next to a refrigerator. <laughs> like He is literally three times as wide as she is. But what I saw accompanying the pictures was a note that I thought was also interesting that said Betty White was alive to see all 27 New York Yankees World Championships. <laughs> she was born in 1922. Wow. Yankees won their first World Series in 23. And it should be noted that since Betty White passed away in 2021, the Yankees have not won a World Series. This is true. Probably pretty safe to say they're not going to win it this year either. I think that they're struggling, yes. Yeah. Could Betty White have cursed the Yankees? <laughs> the Betty White curse. You heard it here first. Yeah. It's like the curse of the Bambino, but, you know, different. Right. Uh, there uh, is also, <laughs> this is this is so up our alley here. There apparently was an entire website called Golden Girl Sports that I guess focused on sports references on the show The Golden Girls. But uh, <laughs> the page is no longer because I was going to... You know, peruse that, but it is not to be found anymore, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, though, there are some Betty White signed baseballs out there, too. Even some that are graded by PSA and up for auction. Wow. So they, they, they are signed in the sweet spot by her, though. So very Perfect. professional. Uh, another note while digging in this episode, Rawlings actually made a Steve Bilko model first baseman's mitt. Really? Yeah, the Steve Bilko claw. And you can still get one used, of course, but I found one on Poshmark. The price had been slashed from $1,234 to now only $35. Wow, that's a heck of a percentage off. That kind of seems like a steal if you want a, a Steve Bilko uh, claw. Which you, most people probably do upon hearing this. I'm not going to lie. I looked at it and I'm like, for 35 bucks, I mean, right. it's pretty cool. Man. <laughs> it's not that bad. Maybe put it in a, in a case and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. I mean, because it's interesting because it it looks kind of like, the, you know, a first baseman's mitt from today, but not quite. You right. know, that it's part of that evolution. Um, so it's, it's interesting to look at, but there you go. There's Steve Bilko, somebody that, again, I, I knew the name, but had no idea anything about him, but, but we have so many, we've done so many stories about these big guys that just tear up the minor leagues or the, the PCL, but just can't, can't quite get that toehold in the big leagues, but they're still yeah. very interesting nonetheless. Absolutely. That was fun. All right. So uh, there you go. There is our main topic for this week. Mark, that means that uh, we've got two segments down and one more to go. So uh, you want to do it? Yeah, I'm, I'm up for it. All right. Why don't you throw it to the theme this week? Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. Help us as we play another round of Wax Back Hero. Gotta pull the Wax Back Hero. Uh, let's see, Mark, looking at the scoreboard, uh, I know it's been a week or two since we've played. I know you broke my win streak last time we did play. Looking at the scoreboard, I am sitting on 10 and you are at 8. So yep. I'm yeah, right up there. I mean, we're right behind you. Yeah, but I'm 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 usually not ahead at the halfway mark like this. Right. So. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it my best shot. Uh, if you're new here, uh, this is how we do this. We're gonna open a couple of packs of wax or junk wax, as they're commonly referred to, uh, cards from the uh, late '80s. Actually, today it's 1988 Fleers. We're gonna be opening. We're well, gonna some do of my favorites. Oh, good. I'll send them to you then. Red, white, and blue. 
Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to open these and uh, we're each going to have a pack. We are going to total the baseball reference war of the player on each card and uh, total those up. But we got a couple of extra rules that can give you plus or minus points. Uh, anything on the player's face, that means glasses, flip down, uh, sunglasses, uh, beard, Brady Anderson, sideburns, a, a teardrop tattoo, anything like that, you're going to get an extra tenth of a point, uh, including a mustache. And if it is a Tom Selleck-esque, Wade Bogg-esque, Keith Hernandez-esque mustache, we will give you even a bonus extra tenth of a point there. If they're wearing real stirrups where we can see the sanitaries underneath, that's an extra tenth of a point. But if we uh, if we catch wind of two and ones, we don't like that. That's a minus tenth of a point. If the player won an award that year, Rookie of the Year, Cy Young, MVP, All-Star, or Gold Glove, that is an extra half point of war for each. If there's a Hall of Famer on the card, even if they're not the focus, you get a whole extra point of war. If Ricky Henderson shows up in either pack, I'm going to get five points. If Nolan Ryan uh, shows up in either pack, Mark, you're going to get the five points. We are also going to be handing out half a point of uh, goodness if there is a pop culture reference that uh, is tied to something important like a TV show, a movie, a meme, anything like that. It's kind of our discretion uh, if we can find that easily enough. If the player's name shows up on the Mitchell report or they were suspended at any point for drugs or something along those lines or PEDs or other things that get you arrested, uh, that's going to be a minus half a point. And Mark, we're both going to pick a team as well. And just like Ricky and Nolan Ryan, if my team shows up in either pack, I get half a point. If your team shows up in either pack, you get half a point. So who are you going to go with this week? You know, I, I'm going to go for, uh, I'm going to take the big swing and go with the Astros. Uh, you're you're going to take a big swing. So I need to go with a trash organization. Uh, I'm going to go with the Giants. <laughs> I listen, my team is threatening to not just threatening, planning on leaving. And uh, despite the fact that we helped save the uh, trash giants uh, from moving to Florida, they refused to do anything to help. So that's not right. And the owner of the A's grew up a Giants fan. So, oh, well, sell the team. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I know he just got released for something and we talked about Gangrel and, and he wearing the cell shirt a while ago. Uh, I found a picture this week of CM Punk repping a cell. Uh, oh, nice. T-shirt. So, all right, uh, Mark, I got two packs here. I got 1988 Fleer, a left hand, right hand. Which one would you like? Left hand. Left hand. All right. I'm going to have you go first and uh, let's go ahead and open up this pack. All right, Mark, let's get right in here. Oh, well, it's kind of a tragic one to start out with here. I know the uh, 88 Tops podcast just did a episode on this guy, Donnie Moore, here with the Angels. Oh, yeah. Relief pitcher. Very sad, yes. Let's see. Uh, Donnie Moore, yeah, we're going to we're gonna steer clear of all the uh, kind of depressing stuff. 13 years in the big leagues, uh, four with California, four with the Cubs, three with Atlanta, and then St. Louis in Milwaukee. One apiece. 1988 was his final year in the big leagues. For the Angels, he went 5-2 and two with a 4.91 ERA. Uh, let's see. He had four saves that year, 33 innings pitched, 48 hits. Yikes. Uh, 22 strikeouts and eight walks for a ERA plus of 79, and that will equal a war of minus 0.4. He does have a mustache, so... Uh, uh, so that will uh, save you a little bit there. Of course, 1986, we don't want to... I mean, we I, we kind of got to talk about the postseason. I mean, he gave a big home run to Dave Henderson, the Boston yep. Red Sox, and uh, had some mental health issues after that, and uh, I believe took his own life. Um, let's see. First round draft pick by the Chicago Cubs in 1973. And uh, not much of uh, transactions to talk about after that. Okay, so uh, yeah, we're going to just... Move on to the next card because uh, we're feeling good today. Uh, next, you have got somebody whose uh, utility bills you could probably still find on the internet. Here he is with the Rangers. It is Odeby McDowell. Odeby McDowell. Odeby Young again? Yes. He was a pretty big prospect when he was first drafted. Yeah, remember, he was on that Team USA uh, team in 1988, I think it was. Yep. and yep. Uh, or No, 84. I'm sorry, 1984. And Yeah, he was considered one of the top guys on that team. Boy, he was drafted about 15,000 times, uh, mm-hmm. including three times in the first round and once in the second round. Good for him. Uh, played seven years in the big leagues, five with Texas, two with Atlanta, and part of a season with Cleveland. 1988 with Texas, he appeared in 120 games. 
Uh, hit 247, 311 on base, six home runs, 37 RBI, 33 stolen bases. That's not bad. 85 OPS plus. And that is good for a war of 1.4. That surprises me. That is good news for you. He's also got a mustache and he's got real stirrups. So that'll be a 1.6 for you. Very nice. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty impressive for O.D.B. McDowell. Oh, wow. He was traded. (laughs) He was traded in 88 by the Rangers, along with the governor, Jerry Brown and Pete O'Brien to Cleveland for Julio Franco. Really? 1988. Still another 30 years to play. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) geez. Uh, Julio was around forever. Uh, Let's see. In terms of uh, pop culture. Now, I kind of I mean, he's meme worthy because of his, uh, you know, his, his power bills that were published every week in, or uh, every month in Deadspin back in the, uh, the, the 2010s. I, I'd be willing to give you uh, maybe a tenth of a point for that. I think that's fair. You're not going to, okay. certainly not going to sneeze at, at free points, but yeah. No, you're... absolutely not. Okay, uh, your next card, pitcher for the San Francisco Trash Giants, so that's my team, Mike Lacoste. Mike Lacoste. Starting pitcher? Yep, definitely a starter. Mike Lacoste, 14 years in the big leagues, uh, six with the Giants, three with the Reds, three with Houston, and then one with Kansas City. 1988 for the Giants, he went 7-7 seven and seven with a 3.62 ERA, 114 innings, 99 hits given up, 70 strikeouts, a 91 ERA plus, and that is good for a war of exactly 0.0. <laughs> well, that's a lot. I mean, he was 500. Thanks. He was 500 almost every year. His career total was 98 and 103. <laughs> he totally was. I mean, he so, is the epitome of a zero war player, right? I mean, he is. Yeah. Uh, he is your average. Well, uh, okay. Now, WAA is wins against average. War, though, is against replacement, which is a minor league player. So oh, it's, yes. a, it's a little bit different. Uh, he does have a mustache here. So you'll get a tenth of a point, but he's on the trash Giants. So that's a minus half a point. So it'll end up being a minus point four for you. Okay, so you are at one even. You've got a member of the uh, Oakland A's now. Pitcher Jay Howell, the third. That's Thurston. Oh, okay. Yeah, my close though. My my bad there. Uh, Jay Howell, 15 years in the big leagues. Five with the Dodgers, three with Oakland, three with the Yankees, and then Atlanta, Texas, Chicago, and Cincinnati. Member of the 1988 World Series. We don't talk about that. The uh, 1988, in between two All-Star years. So you just missed out there. 88, he went five and three with the Dodgers. A 2.08 ERA in 50 games. 65 innings pitched, 44 hits, 20, uh, 70 strikeouts and a 162 ERA plus. And that is going to equal a war of 2.0 for a reliever. I'll take that. Yeah. Nothing on the card is going to help you out. Uh, now we should mention that, uh, he was traded in 1984 along with Tim Burtzis, Stan Javier, Eric Plunk, and Jose Rio to the A's for somebody named Ricky Henderson. That was a big trade. I think I think if, if somebody is traded for Ricky Henderson, I should automatically get five points. I think you should automatically uh, ask the rules committee. Of which I am the chair. I agree. <laughs> right. I don't have veto power or anything? Nope. Nope. You are merely a stockholder. But all right. We'll let that go. Uh, you're at 3.0 now. And uh, let's see, next you have got, oh, this guy we've talked about before. He was in uh, he was in a book we talked about a while ago. It is second baseman for the Padres, Randy Ruffin Ready. Randy Ready. I don't know if Ruffin was a nickname, but I just said it. Randy Max Ready. Oh, that's a good middle name right there. I'm Max Ready. I'm not just Ready. Max. Yeah, Yeah, no kidding. 13 years in the big leagues, five with Philly, four with the Pods, four with the Brewers, and then Montreal and Oakland scattered amongst there. 1988 with the Padres, he appeared in 114 games, hit 266, 346 on base, seven home runs, 39 RBI, and a 113 OPS plus. That's good for a 1.8 war. I mean, it's no Jay Howell, but it's pretty good. That's not bad at all. Let's see. Uh, He is definitely wearing real stirrups, which is good news for you. Uh, But I don't see anything else there. But I mean, stirrups are cool as it is. Uh, He was traded for uh, traded with John Crock to the Phillies for Chris James at Hmm. one point. Let's see. Your next card is uh, 
Somebody we like to celebrate his entire catalog. He's got a good mustache. It's Tom Bolton of the Red Sox. Yes. Future Secretary of State. Oh, wait, no, I'm getting confused. Uh, I was going with the office space reference, but then you had to go and make yes. it political. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Bolton, eight years in the big leagues, six with Boston, and then uh, he spent a little bit of time in Cincinnati, Baltimore, and Detroit. 1988 with the Red Sox, he went one and three, 4.75 ERA in 28 games, 30 innings pitched, 21 strikeouts, and 88 ERA plus. And that is a war of minus 0.1. He does have a mustache, though. That'll wipe that out and uh, get you uh, get you right even there at zero. So no harm, no foul. Uh, apparently, Bolton is a member of the Metropolitan Nashville Public School Sports Hall of Fame. Congratulations uh, on, on that honor. Yeah. I know a guy that's in that. Yeah, Tom Bolton. Yeah, nobody besides him. Okay. All right, uh, next you've got somebody here that uh, could get you some points. Uh, it's an outfielder for the New York Metropolitans. It is Daryl Starry. Ooh, it could be good. It's all a question of how many games he played in 1988. Uh, let's see, Straw, 17 years in the big leagues, eight with the Mets, five with the Yankees, three with the Dodgers, one with the Giants. That got me some points in Immaculate Grid, nice. I think, last week. Uh, good news for you, 1988 All-Star year. Second in the MVP voting. Ooh. Straw never won an MVP. This was the closest he came with uh, coming in second. He led the league in home runs with 39, 101 RBI, 29 stolen bases, hit 269, 366 on base, led the league in slugging with 545 and OPS with 911, and led the league in OPS plus with a 165, which will equal a war of 5.5. Yes, way to go, Daryl. Daryl. Well, we already know he's getting the uh, the Simpsons full point. Yes. For being on Homer at the bat. Uh, looking at this card, I don't know how to tell you this, but he's got two and ones on. He does have eye black on. He always has a wispy mustache, but I cannot see it. Yeah, he usually just had some kind of like peach fuzz. Yeah, I mean, this is a full body shot at Wrigley Field. That's a really good looking card, though. I'm not going to lie. The Mets pull over. It says New York across it in script. This is I'm going to set this card aside because it's a really good looking card. I'm going to go ahead and give you the one point. uh, If I didn't mention, if you're on The Simpsons, uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch or Seinfeld, you get an automatic point in that uh, pop culture reference. So. There you go. First round draft pick, no surprise. First overall by the Mets. Uh, I mean, he's had a lot of stuff go on with him. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're going to probably not talk about a lot of it. I didn't know this. Daryl DJ Strawberry Jr. He was a, uh, a basketball player for the Maryland basketball team, University of Maryland, and was drafted by the Suns in 2007. But that's I'm that's kidding. all it says. So I don't hmm. I'm assuming he probably didn't play that long. It was a terp. Uh, let's see here. He was in The Simpsons. We know that also featured in the reality game show Pros versus Joes. I really liked that show uh, and was also on the Celebrity Apprentice. Oh, wow. Where he was fired. Of course. Yes. You know what? I'm going to give you an extra half a point. Beyond the Simpsons, just because he's in a lot of stuff. He also rapped and mesmerized, so. <laughs> that's true, too. You know, that's, that's enough right there. Uh, all right, so I'm going to set that card aside because that's a good-looking card. And I'm going to set this next card aside. Uh, one, because it's going to get me a plus five, baby. Oh, oh no. <laughs> it is a Hall of Famer, Richard Henderson. Wow. This is, a, this is one of my favorite Ricky cards. It's It looks like it's taken probably in Toronto. It must be because it's outside in a turf stadium. Uh, it's, it's exhibition stadium. That's the only outdoor turf stadium except for Kansas City, of which this is clearly not in uh, 19. And this picture would have been taken in 1987. But he's got the road Yankee uniform on. He's got two sweatbands on. He's got the Mizunos, the real stirrups. You're going to get plenty of points off of this. But I'm going to minus five right off the top for being Ricky Henderson. And again, I think I've only drawn him once while you've drawn him like 13 times. Yeah, no kidding. Let's see. uh, Without going through all of the Ricky superlatives, good news for you in 1988. He was uh, an all-star. No surprise there. 140 games, uh, led the league in steals. Shocker with 93. Hit 305, 394 on base. 
Uh, six home runs, 50 RBI. Let's see, he scored 118 runs, a 124 OPS plus, and all of that is going to equal a 6.3 war. Hey, he saved me. He's a Hall of Famer, so that's 7.3. He has got real stirrups on. Uh, he kind of falls in the Daryl uh, category here. He has always has a wispy mustache, but... These are full body shots and I can't see. Yeah. So I don't feel bad not giving it to you because you're at 7.4 plus he was an all star. So that will be a 7.9 from Ricky Henderson. Very, very nice. Not helping me out. Even though you got five. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's on top of the after the minus uh, 0.5. Oh, we've got to do uh, pop culture. I'm going to go ahead and give you a full point on that because he's got rap songs named after him. He's got books published. And uh, I've got a lot of pop culture stuff in my room I'm staring at that has him on it. So, uh, And he knows MC Hammer. And he knows MC Hammer. I wonder if he knows Ricky Hill. <laughs> Very well might. I don't know. Should I ask that? All right, so you're at 15.8, and your final card is going to get you some mustache points. Pitcher for the Pirates, Doug Drayback. Ooh, there we go. He could have had a good year. Solid starting pitcher. 13 years in the big league, six with the Bucks, four with Houston, one with the Yankees, Orioles, and White Sox in 1988. With the Bucks, he went 15-7 and seven with a 3.08 ERA, three complete games, one complete game shutout, Pitched 219 innings, 194 hits, 127 Ks, a 110 ERA plus, and that is good for a war of 2.8. He's got a good mustache here. It's a close-up head and shoulder shot, so that will be a 2.9 for Douglas Drayback. I'll take it. <clears throat> Nothing really pop culture-wise for Doug Drayback. Seems like he would have his job. Yeah, seems yeah. like he would have shown up in in Bud's. Uh, closet you know during the strike in 94 on married sure. with children but i don't see anything regarding that so uh that will do you've got a good score here 18.7 whoa that's gonna be a hard one to uh to beat but let's uh go ahead and see what we've got where's my pack there it is let's go ahead and open this up all right well i i'm starting out with a hall of famer so this is uh this is good i am starting out with uh kirby puckett Ooh, nice 12 years in the big leagues for Kirby. Of course, every one of them with the Twins. And from 1986 to the end of his career, he was an all-star every year. So uh, I know I'm going to get points for that. 1988, 158 games. Hit 356. Didn't lead the league, but hit 356, 375 on base. Did lead the league in hits with 234. 24 home runs, 121 RBI, 6 stolen bases, and a OPS plus of 153. All of that will equal 7.8. He's a Hall of Famer, so that'll be 8.8. He was an all-star, so that will be 9.3. And he won a gold glove, so that'll be 9.8. Let's see. I can't see if he's got that wispy mustache on here. So I'm going to go ahead and take the 9.8 to start out with. I mean, I, it's, I guess if I have to. Uh, yeah, that's a rough start. That man. is basically half your score yeah. <laughs> on the first card. Uh, first over, uh, no, sorry, third overall pick, first round in the 1982 draft by the Twins. Uh, of course, uh, career ended early because of an eye injury, got hit by a pitch, and then had some problems with his eyes. Oh, wow, I did, I did not know this. David Ortiz was a friend, made friends with Kirby Puckett, having come up in the Twins organization, and wore number 34 with the Red Sox to honor Puckett. Hmm. No, that's nice. Yeah, I, I did not know that. That is uh, that's pretty cool. feel like Kirby has got to have some pop culture stuff. Uh, you know, obviously he's in the news after he retired. A lot of it has been proven to be false, but uh, I'm not seeing anything here pop culture-wise, <laughs> and I feel like there should be. Hmm. I don't, I'm not thinking of anything. Oh, well, he was in the uh, MC Hammer Too Legit to Quit video. So this there you go. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Ricky was in that as well. But I, I gave you a point and a half for the uh, for the, the Ricky Henderson pop culture. So I don't feel bad. I'm going to give myself a point there if you're in an MC Hammer video. Yeah. There you go. All right. So I'm at 10.8 after one card. I like where it's headed. Uh, next, uh, let's see, pitcher for the Reds, Guy Hoffman. <laughs> you got me on that. Now, he might be French, and it might be Guy Hoffman, but I doubt it. 
<laughs> oh no, he's born in Ottawa, Ottawa, oh. I- Ottawa, Illinois. It's G. No, it's Ottawa, Illinois. <laughs> so, <laughs> what are the odds? That's so weird. That is weird. Uh, let's see. Six years in the big leagues, three with the White Sox, and then one apiece for the Rangers, Reds, and Cubs. 1988 was his final year in the big leagues with Texas. No record in 11 games, 5.24 ERA, 79 ERA plus, and a war of minus 0.1. Nothing on this card. Do I get points? This is, looks like it was during spring training because he's wearing a mesh hat. Any points for that? Nice. Um, not this year. Wow. He played three seasons in Japan for Oryx. Oh, wow. Where he went 20 and 19. Oh, wow. Right over that 500 pitcher again. Yep. All right. So I'm uh, at 10.7 now. My next card is, oh, pitcher for the uh, for the Blue Jays, Dwayne Ward. Not Dwayne Reed. Dwayne Ward. Dwayne Ward. Nine years in the big leagues, nine with Toronto, and then, uh, oh, he came up with Atlanta, but was traded in his first season in the big leagues to Toronto, where he spent the rest of his career there. He's won two World Series, obviously both with the Blue Jays. 1988, he went 9-3 and three with a 3.30 ERA in 64 games. He had 15 saves, 111 innings pitched, 101 hits, 91 strikeouts, a 118 ERA+. Plus. And that is good for a war of exactly 1.0. No now, complaining about that. Yeah, now he does have a mustache. It's not a great one, but it's a mustache. First round pick, ninth overall in 82 by Atlanta. He was traded. Oh, that this is a trade we know about. He was traded for Doyle Alexander down the stretch. Oh, yeah. He got the win in that uh, decisive game six when uh, Ricky Henderson scored from second base on the walk-off home run by Joe Carter. Wow, ah, never forget it. That's how we describe it here. Uh, all right, so I am at 11.8. Next, I have got a pitcher for the Royals. This is a good card because it's Jerry Gleaton. <laughs> 12 years in the big leagues. Royals, Rangers, Mariners, Tigers, White Sox, Pirates. Bunch of teams. 1988 with the Royals, he went 0-4 and four with a 3.55 ERA, 42 games, 3 saves, 38 innings pitch, 33 hits, 29 strikeouts, and a 114 ERA plus. And that is a war of 0.4, and he does have a mustache. So that's half a point for me for Jerry Don Gleaton. That's, that's not so bad for like a middle reliever. Yeah, I'll take it from JD, as I call him. Uh, first yeah. round draft pick, 17th overall by the Rangers in 1979. Oh, he was traded for Mario Mendoza at one point. Mm. And uh, he was traded by the Mariners with one of my favorite pitchers of all time, Gene Nelson. Oh, sure. Next. Oh, I got another Hall of Famer. I like where this pack is headed. Oh, no. The Wizard of Oz. Oh, boy. This could be big. You know that? I, thinking of the his nickname... It works on two levels, and I was thinking about this because I was using his uh, his card in, in MLB The Show. And uh, the Wizard of Oz, obviously his first name's Ozzy, so that works. But the plays that he would make on defense elicited Oz from the crowd as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Listen, I like to enhance my, uh, my, my calm while I'm playing video games, so these things happen. Uh, Hall of Famer, of course, 1982. He was on the World Series 15 times. He was an all-star. 13 times he won a gold glove. 19 years in the big leagues, 13 gold gloves. He won a silver slugger in 1987. Wow. With no home runs. I mean, is it, does that not just tell you, though, about 80s baseball, where the shortstop that wins the silver slugger didn't hit a home run? <laughs> I mean, it was just all about slapping the ball and more importantly, your defense is a shortstop. Let's see, in 1988, he was an all-star again, 153 games. He hit 270, 350 on base. He hit three home runs this year, but no silver slugger. 51 RBI, 57 stolen bases and a 98 OPS plus. He also won a gold glove that year. And, Shocking. Uh, so that'll be a 6.6 .6 war. He's a Hall of Famer, so that's 7.6. All-star and gold glove. That'll be an 8.6. Uh, let's see. Looking at this card, he has got a mustache, so that'll be an 8.7. He is on. He was on the Simpsons on Homer at the Bat, so that is an additional one point. Um, and he hosted uh, this week in baseball. So, and he was on the baseball bunch. So I think that's worth at least another half a point of... Pop culture. You're killing me, man. You absolutely killing me. Well, I'm me. already I'm already in the lead by quite a bit here. So you need some big negatives. <laughs> well, if there's one person that's gonna do it, I'm uh, I got a chance. Of course, he was the uh, 
NLCS MVP in 1985, hit 435 against the Dodgers in the NLCS, 10 for 23. Wow. Including a big home run, I remember, to right field that just barely got out. But uh, that's uh, that's pretty impressive, those numbers. All right, uh, next. Wow. Uh, where These names, I swear, it, Keith Hernandez's book is just littered with these names. Uh, because I would very rarely think of pitcher for the Red Sox, Joe Sambito, but mm-hmm. I was just reading about him last night. <laughs> I remember Joe Sambito. You're right. I wouldn't have thought of him out of nowhere like I did Ron <laughs> like I, Yeah, like I wouldn't think of him while doing Immaculate Grid. I can't pull up who he played for, even if I did remember him. I, I would remember he played for the Mets because he's Keith's teammate that he talks about in 85. And in 85, that was his lone year in the Mets. He spent 11 years in the big leagues, eight with Houston, two with uh, the Red Sox, and then one with the Mets. 1987, though, was his final year in the big leagues. So I am going to get nothing uh, nothing out of this. Nothing on the cards going to help me. I mean, do I get pop culture points because he's in Keith Hernandez's book? or? Yeah, I think that's a little too focused. All right, I'll I'll let it go. He's also in Wikipedia. You don't get anything for that either. All right. I've got three cards left here. I'm currently at 22.5. You are at 18.7. So, I mean, if I pull a Nolan Ryan, if I pull uh, some, you take Astros, it could still happen. But uh, let's see. Mm. Next uh, pitcher for the Expos. This guy has got an episode coming his way here on this podcast. It is Pasquale Perez. You know, I lived in Atlanta, and when I first moved there, I got lost several times because the there's a lot of freeways and stuff. But there's a freeway that just circles the uh, the city. It's called the Perimeter, and uh, it's pretty easy to get around once you realize that. But he never realized that and missed a start because of that. But ran right. out of gas, didn't have a cell phone, couldn't call anybody. Wrong way, Perez. Yeah, that's why his nickname is I-285, because that is the... Uh, that's what the perimeter, the official name is. It's He's uh, also called Perimeter Pasquale. Oh, I like that. There you go. <laughs> uh, 11 years in the big leagues, four with Atlanta, three with Montreal, two with the Bucks, two with the Yankees. 1988 with Montreal. He went 12-8 and eight with a 2.44 ERA. Uh, let's see, 188 innings pitch, 133 hitch, 131 strikeouts, a 147 ERA plus. Led the league in whip with a 0.941. I like it. And uh, that will be a war of 4.5. 4.5. Wow. I'll take it. Wow. Did not see that coming. He was uh, had his own Ephus pitch. The Pasquale pitch is what they called it. Of course, he was a big part of that brawl in 1984 between the Padres and Atlanta. Where, wow. Oh, yeah. It just like 18 different brawls. People couldn't yeah. even hit people. But they were still brawling. Uh, had uh, Cousins. That were uh, or no, I'm not not cousins brothers that also made the big leagues, Melito and Carlos, and uh, did not. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away. Not a pretty episode uh, during a robbery. Oof. So yikes! Uh, sorry. Wow. I I I don't know how I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but that is uh, that is really awful. Uh, this is interesting. Pasquale first made his trademark peek through the legs to check the runner on first in the Dominican League. Now, I know the big thing now is that some pitchers, right-handed pitchers, to check the runner at first are looking over their right shoulder instead of their left. Yes. I have not seen anybody look through their legs recently to check the runner. I haven't seen that recently either. Let's bring it back. Uh, All right. Uh, Next, you've got pitcher for the uh, Cleveland team. Went on to be a pitching coach and manager, John Farrell. The darts player, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's see, In as a player, eight years in the big leagues, five with Cleveland, two with California, one with Detroit. 1988, uh, let's see, he went 14 and 10 with 4.24 ERA, 210 innings pitched, four complete games, 216 hits, 92 strikeouts, 97 ERA plus, and that is good for a 2.8 war. Still, you're still scoring. I am, I am looking to double you up is what I'm trying to do. Oh, he was the pitching coach for the Red Sox under Terry Francona. They had been teammates in Cleveland. I wonder if he's in Cleveland now. I don't know. But according to Wikipedia, as of 2019, he spends 10 months serving as a minor league pitching scout for the Reds. And the other two months, he spends lobster fishing on his boat, Seaweed. <laughs> wow. That's pretty cool. 
Uh, all right, so I'm down to my final card here. It is, uh, you know, I know this name. I know nothing about this guy, and I think there's stories about him. Uh, here he is an outfielder for the Cubs, Bob Dernier. You know, I'm not familiar with Bob Dernier. I get the feeling that this is one of those that some of our listeners have stories for and are like, oh, why aren't they talking about X, Y, and Z? And I apologize. Let's see if what we can learn about him. Uh, Ten years in the big league, six with Philly, Four with the Cubs, 1988 with Philadelphia, 68 games, hit 289, 330 on base, one home run, 10 RBI, 13 stolen bases, a 92 OPS plus, and that is good for a .4 war. See here, he's got eye black and he's got real stirrups, so I like him already. That'll be an extra .2. Let's see, he won a gold glove in 1984 as an outfielder. Also got some MVP votes there. Well, he was traded by the Phillies with Gary Matthews, who, as we know earlier, made his debut today. Why do I know him so much? I don't know. Uh, Let's see. So he was the leadoff batter for the Cubs in 1984. Rhino was hitting second, and they were called the Daily Double by Harry Carey. Very nice. A member of the 83 Phillies team that won the National League pennant, lost the World Series to Baltimore. And then uh, also the Cubs when they won the East in 84, but lost to the Padres. And uh, yeah, I have no idea why I am so familiar with his name. Maybe just because he's been a, a, a coach for quite a while for several different teams. And that's how I've known about him. But yeah, there you go. Uh, so anyway, my score is a 30.4. That's ridiculous. Come on, man. Yeah, I mean, 18.7, which is what you scored, is a great score. And I blew it away. And yeah, I that was even, ridiculous. Dude. You even had a Ricky Henderson. Uh, uh, even if you had that Ricky and hadn't minus those points, I still would have. Beaten still him. wouldn't work. No. Yeah. So. All right. So that'll take me up to 11 wins. Starting a new streak, boys. All right. That's going to wrap it up for this uh, edition of Wax Packs Heroes. Also going to wrap up the show. Thank you again for listening and joining us each week. Uh, again, check out the show notes. There'll be a lot of links down there uh, this week for uh Music, all, all your music man needs uh, in podcast form. We'll put that uh, link to Ricky Hill and the Saturday Night Live with Bill Murray and uh, a bunch of other stuff. So check that out. It also has all our socials. Sorry to say I've been uh, very lax on. I just, you know, you can get social media burnout. And I think I definitely have that right now. But uh, <laughs> you can also send us messages that way if you want. And uh, Mark, we also have an email address. They can do the same. And we made it easy to remember. You know the show, Two Strike Noise? Just type that in. Two Strike Noise. Spell it out. T-W-O Strike Noise at gmail.com. All right. That's going to wrap up this episode. Thank you very much for joining. And uh, you know what? We'll see you again next week on the next edition of Two Strike Noise. Thank you all. God bless you. Have a great day. 